discussion. Sit down. Start with the first first comment and first question. Uh, the comment concerns obviously uh, the LPI and the stuff you show uh, that that uh, okay it is like symmetric and there are these extreme which which makes the change. But the thing is, and that's what we show in our paper, is that these extremes are probably artifacts, right? So even so, even though I really like your like uh, like message that we you know depending on uh, this we should kind of take care about the extremes. In this case of the Living Planet databases, these extremes are probably some weird uh, you know, things which do not mean too much. So, so my position is that uh, basically Living Planet database is not very useful for, for these things because there are so many weird data which actually bias the, uh, the index down even though they, they are meaningless. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would agree. I, I think most of those, I mean, I think we actually showed, I forget the exact statistics, but that clump of extreme changes were, many of them were very short time series, oftentimes yeah. just two data points, and so. In, and in our paper we show why the short time series really changed, uh, make, make this bias. But my question is, uh, to which extent uh, do you, did you explore uh, this role of non-native species, for example, for these biodiversity changes. Because you mentioned that, of course, they play a role and so on, but uh, today I showed you this, uh, this map of birds in Europe. But it was with uh, all the non-native uh, species removed, actually. Okay. So, to which extent the non-native species are responsible for these, like, uh, balance changes? Don't, don't, do you know? Um, in that paper, we did not, it was too hard, there were so many different species, yeah. it was too hard to get a list. It's not something I've directly explored, but I know some other people that have worked on it. I've seen some, I think they're still unpublished results that doesn't really change the story if you take out the non-native mm. species. Yeah, that's that was exactly what... I think at the regional scale it does, but at the local scale, mm. uh, you know, it's, it goes back to the turnover, right? There's so many species coming in, species going out, and most of them are native still. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, questions? Yeah. Uh, I would like to discuss maybe um, the, social, the social science part of this um, of the presentation, but I'm not sure if it's um, it's not ecology, but um, I I'm not sure if the or I would like to discuss if the hope is really that good or that better than uh, fear, uh, if there is some. Uh, Campaign uh, or some um, people who or political subjects uh, <coughs> who are try, which are trying to use fear to stop, like like they are able to stop your um, argument or like using your use uh, like I call it environmental environmental um, using hope for. Um, uh, defend or protecting the environmental and biodiversity if uh, there is fear that can stop your uh, chances to, um, uh, yeah, to do it like yeah yeah I mean obviously it's complicated and probably you know advertisers know more about this than any of us do but um, I think it, you think about who you're affecting by these different emotions, right? And when you have a story about insect Armageddon, who is actually caring about an insect? Whether it's true or not is a whole other conversation, but, um, or the living planet, 70% of vertebrates have disappeared. Who actually cares about that? It's people who already care about biodiversity, right? So is it really changing anything for the people who and, you know, we all know there's a crowd of people who don't care about biodiversity and will never care, right? What you really want to be doing is moving the group of people in the middle. And is fear the thing that's changing the group of people in the middle? And I think coming back to hope, too, right? So for the group of people who already care about biodiversity, is fear going to cause them to have more actions, changes in their own lives? Or is hope going to cause them to have more changes in their own lives, right? And it, I think the hope... 
I, I don't know what your perception is, but I give a talk sometimes about biodiversity to students, undergraduate students, so 20 year olds. And in a room the size, one student would have a panic attack before my talk was over. And I've talked to other professors, that's very, the anxiety around this is so high. So is fear gonna make that person do something different from what they're doing today, or is hope more likely to make that person do something different from what they're doing today? So I think the fear and the hope messages are both kind of focusing on the people who already care about biodiversity. And I think the social concern piece is the one that really motivates the people in the middle. This is just my personal sense, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a social scientist, I'm not an advertising campaign person, but that's my sense is that different messages motivate different groups of people. Go ahead. Do I have to use this? Okay. <laughs> uh, I will, to this question, I would just like to add a, a, an example of a fear campaign and an <coughs> underutilized hope campaign uh, where we used to fearmonger a lot about uh, the ozone hole, which was a real concern. But then thanks to effective, uh, effective laws that were put in place, we managed to really uh, uh, to do something with it, and uh, the ozone layer is more or less healthy nowadays, I think. But we didn't really manage to uh, talk about it as much uh, about these about this accomplishment. So nowadays we have, uh, I would say, right-wing pundits that use the ozone layer fearmongering as an example of something that is not an issue. Like, see, they uh, they scared us with this ozone hole thing, and where is it now? Because. People do not know that we managed to uh, deal with it thanks to uh, our laws and, and things like that. So yeah, that's just an example of that. Yeah, I, I think that long timescale perspective is a really important thing to think about with fear because I grew up in the 1970s, which was a very cold time. We were breaking temperature records and we now know it was just because of you know uh, North Atlantic oscillations and cycles. but. Scientists and the press were starting to talk about the next ice age in the 1970s, right? And then we started talking about global, and it turns out the real scientists who were doing climate science actually knew about global warming by the 1970s. But the public conversation was about the next ice age, and then 10 years later, they're talking about the next global warming crisis. And it really, I, I think the fear button, we have to be really sure we're accurate about the fear button before we start pushing it. And these uh, big headlines about insects are disappearing, 70% of vertebrates are disappearing, the big headline in the US, three billion birds have disappeared, right? All of those things, you don't have to be a scientist or a mathematician to know that means in my lifetime or 30 years from now, there's gonna be no birds left on the planet, right? And A, how many people really think that's not believable that there will be no birds left on the planet? And B, 30 years from now, we're gonna look really stupid when there are still lots of birds on the planet, right? So I, I, I think pushing the fear button, you know, in the United States, we have the story about crying wolf, right? You, you, you push the fear button too many times and people start to ignore it. And I think when we push the fear button and it's not even true, uh, it does have consequences over the long time. And actually the ozone is a great story, right? Because the reason that got solved is there was a solution immediately available. It happened to make somebody rich, right? The chemical company that had the replacement for Freon already had it lined up and they had it ready, but the solution was right there, right at hand. And that's why the, so it was more of the hopes. It was a technology story, but it was also the hope story of why politicians got together because they knew they actually could fix it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I would like to uh, get back to the turnover in time, the temporal turnover. You emphasize that communities are changing faster or that humans are causing the turnover to be more intense. And I was just wondering how strong is your confidence or what's the data or models that actually are the base for that claim? Because to me, everything will have some sort of turnover always. Yeah. And so how do you know that it's exceptional? So, yeah, it's a great question. So, absolutely, turnovers match all right. I, I, one of my closest colleagues uh, on my campus is a paleoecologist, right? And you can't put in that kind of time perspective and not realize change is, right? The equilibrial 
notion of ecology is a very, <laughs> it doesn't exist in the real world, right? Uh, so the question is, is the change faster? And that's a really hard thing to get at, especially because we don't have detailed time series data before humans were impacting systems. So what we did do is we came up with a couple of null models. One of them is just a neutral, straight up Hubble neutral community. So it's kind of a drift model. Uh, and the other one was more of a island biogeography kind of um, model. And they both showed rates of, and then you parameterize it with some parameters from a real system. And they both showed rates of turnover that were, you know, healthy turnover very observable that turnover was happening, but they were both at least twice, like half the speed or more, less than half the speed of these, uh, what we observe in nature. So how confident am I? Low to medium confident, we really need better answers, but to the first approximation that we have available today, some reasonable approximations for just normal drift turnover. Uh, we're going much faster than that. And so humans would be a logical explanation, but it's getting hand wavy, I agree. So uh, to me, what that really says is we don't understand natural turnover, right? We spend so much time talking about equilibrial theories of ecology, we don't talk about a theory of non-equilibrium of turnover, right? And um, so we don't, we don't have a theory of what are the processes of turnover? Is it all stochastic, right? My marbles would certainly give you a turnover theory, right? Every time a marble dies, you draw a new, it's basically Hubble's neutral theory, you draw a marble back out randomly. But is that really, is that most of what's going on with turnover or is turnover more systematically being driven by the environment, right? We know there's global warming, but as I already said, there are these 20 year cycles and 30 year cycles of temperature. Is that really what's, we have no theory of turnover. So that's. Yeah, I would just add that I also, uh was kind of suspicious when I re read this paper with these null models because it's really neutral. How you know? How we know? That, uh, what, do we know that it is realistic at all? But I'm just wondering: wouldn't it be possible to to make some comparison be between like relatively intact communities and like more affected uh, by people, and then to see mm -hmm. what is the normal turnover in relatively intact communities? To sort of a space for time. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Because how? Because this is really crucial for the question. What is like the normal level of turnover? And mm -hmm. I, I really do believe we, we don't know. Yeah. Understood. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I am ordained from different, different, different way now. Uh, you had some point about mechanisms of biodiversity and that uh, they depend on scale. Uh, but uh, it's clear that there must be connection between these mechanisms because uh, as patterns uh, as patterns for larger scales can be derived from patterns from smaller scales, it means that also the mechanisms must be interconnected in some, some way. Do you have any idea uh, what the interconnection between these mechanisms might be? Yeah, so when you start talking about top-down processes instead of bottom-up processes, I would make a distinction between philosophical or tautological scaling up versus mathematical scaling up. Tautologically, yes. When I see evolution happening at a regional scale, it's because this individual died and that individual died and that individual had more babies than any ever, right? It, it does on some level boil down to local scales. And so that, that's uh, on some level, it's a philosophical fact. But can I take the math to go from the local scale to the regional scale? And that, that's a different question. And I, I have a little argument in a paper somewhere uh, suggesting, and um, Odom talked about this too. He called it the trans, uh, what was it? The trans, translocation problem. He basically showed when then you have variance and nonlinear processes, those two things interact with each other to make the mathematics of moving things up to bigger volumes impossible. And so I would say tautologically or philosophically, yes, it has to come from small scale processes. 
But I would say mathematically, not only is it hard, it's actually probably mathematically impossible to work out those very small scale processes and just sum them up to millions of individuals because of two things that are always true in nature, which is nonlinearity and variance. It goes back to Jensen's inequality, basically. Be before, before we go to uh, another question, I, I will a little bit extend uh, Arnold's concern because I was also concerned with it. I will, uh, I'm not uh, absolutely happy with your exposition of this communities as a lottery, right? And the reason is that, of course, if you have, if you have species with given number of individuals and you have in information about species abundance distribution and you put there the information about aggregation, you get realistic patterns. But it does not mean that they emerge out of r random processes, right? Because it is just a mathematical link between these, uh, these things. And it's not about biology, you know? So, so uh, why, they are, why they have this species abundance distribution? Why they have this given level of aggregation? It's all about local mechanisms and processes. And you could easily say, uh, like, the opposite. You know, it's not, not random, it, it, but, but the... But the, the, the variables or parameters you used for derivation of these uh, things actually emerge out of uh, biological processes, right? Uh, you, you remember it was always my like, critical point to this, uh, what, uh, this stuff you did with Jonathan Chase, which you presented in the beginning, that uh, all the species richness patterns are driven by uh, total abundance, abundance distribution, and, and uh, clumping. Yes, of course, but it does not mean that they are caused by it, right? Because the causality can be that actually species richness drives the patterns of, of uh, species abundance distribution or even of, uh, of uh, clumping and so on, right? So, mm -hmm. so what do you think? Well, so I think it's really important to think about scale and when you're talking about this. So, you know, so the clumping, that's a biological process, right? It could be because of habitat affinities. This, yeah. this area is wet, this area is dry. It could be uh, dispersal, right? So there, there are biological processes built into it. But, um, but then again, I question, to me the key question, right, the big driver of this pattern is the species abundance distribution, that you have lots of rare species and a few common species. And I did pull that in at the regional scale. So to me, the question is, which are we more likely to be able to explain the regional species abundance distribution or the local species abundance? Which one are we be more likely to be able to connect to processes? Yeah, but I, I would argue you can do, always do it either way. We can do it at both levels. I think so. Maybe. <laughs> um, so. I really hope I understood it right, and I apologize <clears throat> if I didn't, but so the humpa, human impact on the richness of biodiversity isn't like necessarily negative, not at all. Uh, do, did I understood that correctly, that part? Yeah, I mean, it's a little more complicated. I would say it's a flow chart. First question is, am I in the middle of an agricultural field or a piece of blacktop? If I am, then human impact on biodiversity is 100% negative, right? If I'm not, and I'm in a system where there's plants and animals and there's some nature happening, then the average trend is zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that, that, that part I was talking about, yes. And okay. so, um, do you think there is like a limit to this regulation? Like, because as humans we do, um, as we advance in technology, we have the opportunity to have bigger effect on like the, the biomes and all of that. So do you think there is like a um, time limit till we start to affect this part uh, negatively, like this richness negatively? I, th I think uh, to get the trend of zero, you could have two explanations. One explanation is that humans have positive and negative effects, right? We're, we always talk about the negative effects, but invasive species actually have a positive effect on species richness. Climate change in the short term, as we kind of increasingly realize species expand their range often north before they retract south, that's it's not invasive species, but that's another case of increasing species richness, right? So. 
you could do the central limit theorem of humans have lots and lots of complicated impacts and you run it through a central limit theorem, the sum of many, many impacts added together is gonna to give you a normal distribution. That actually still doesn't completely explain why it's centered around zero because we could have more positive impacts or more negative impacts. So I increasingly, when I started, when we first got that result, I was like, it's a central limit theorem, but I increasingly think you have to come back to this regulation notion that there are, you know, I know David talks about diversity dependent processes all the time and that's, that's regulation of species richness, but we seem to have regulation of total biomass and total abundance as well. Um, yeah, so I increasingly think you have to come back to the regulation and it's, it's a complicated thing to talk about. I think, you know, classic population ecology with this strong density dependence and everything snaps back to the regulation point, but we can't actually predict the regulation point. It's not necessarily tied. I, I don't think it's that, but I, I like, that's why I like the augmented Dickey Fuller. It's kind of a mix of random walk and central tendencies. It's much more density vague. But uh, yeah, I think there's some sort of regulation of the community level processes. And, you know, commence speculation what that is. Um, it's a complicated, we don't know the answer, but that's, that's what I think is going on. So actually humans, David and I were talking about this on the walk over, humans always underestimate exponential growth. But anytime you have exponential growth when you're below something, you're gonna get back to that something very quickly, right? And so humans assume we can knock things off. The, humans assume we're more powerful than the natural regulatory for, forces. But exponential growth is a really powerful natural regulatory force as well. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's all of my thinking. You'll have to figure out the answer. Um, I heard you mention something about uh, pairwise uh, interactions and Lotka Voltera, and because this is my focus right now, I'm looking at competition in birds, then uh, could you please, re because I didn't quite catch what you were uh, saying there, if you could please repeat your point and maybe expand a bit on it. Yeah, yeah it's the notion that um, at local scales, I mean, it's very clear that you can find pairwise competition that's quite strong, right? But at a regional, at, at a local scale. At a local scale, yeah. yeah. But at a regional scale, let's say 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, the pairwise interaction that's most important to species X over here, you move over here and species X, it's pairwise competitor that's most important is gonna be a different species. And so when you average that across a, a bunch of local communities, it starts to look like it's interacting with a lot of species at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's the idea that as you go up to scale, the competition becomes more diffuse. I don't think it disappears, but it becomes more diffuse across many species. Mm -hmm. that, okay. that, that was the argument I'm making anyway. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, so okay, uh, so you are talking about um, human influence which is either negative or net zero uh, but uh, I, I think that there is some net positive uh, human influence uh, for example I discuss it uh, with David uh, you, uh, very often that the uh, highly cultural landscape like it is here in Czech Republic uh, is in fact an artifact of human activity and uh, one could uh, argue that uh, withdrawing from that landscape would uh, in fact uh, decrease uh, total biodiversity uh, in the landscape. So, so there is some kind of uh, human activity which is net positive, I think. Mm -hmm. And it leads me to and to second question, with, uh, which is that you, um, in your mathematical models, you uh, totally omit some kind of abiotic uh, underlying uh, um, conditions or uh, the, 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 the landscape itself, uh, like the mosaic or uh, those, uh, those things, uh, which can be uh, totally uh, uh, responsible for the clumping uh, David uh, mm -hmm. talked about. Yeah, so um, absolutely about managed landscapes, as long as they're not, right, as long as they're not uh, monoculture or high intensity agriculture, managed landscapes can be 
in fact, often are higher species richness. Uh, you observe, observe the same thing around urban gradients, right? The suburbs typically have higher species richness than the city center or the natural countryside, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think managed landscapes are an important, this is where I come back to my point about biodiversity and normative or values-based discussions. I, I, I think, Scientists are afraid of values-based discussions, but I think if we actually want to contribute to the conversation about what we should preserve, we have to start having a conversation about what do people want to preserve, right? And um, yeah, the, these cultural landscapes are, are a very important piece of that. So uh, I completely agree with that. I also agree with the other point too, that I think as you move from the local to the regional scale, that landscape, if you want to call it landscape ecology or heterogeneity, is an important part of the processes at the regional scale that don't, right? One definition of a local community is you've taken all of that out and focused where you have a homogeneous environment. So I think it's one of the reasons I think we need to look more at the regional scale is <clears throat> because landscape ecology does start to come in at that scale. Uh, Francois. <laughs> Yes, I'd like to go back to your uh, papers that you published with uh, Shane Blows uh, in Science Advances, uh, where you were showing that there was basically no homogenization or uh, differentiation. On average. Or, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. the thing is that for at least a decade, we thought in ecology that there was homogenization for sure. And, and we had the real reasons to think about that, such as the generalist and, uh, and specialist species disappearing. So. How did you manage, like, what, can you tell us what did you do in this study that contradict the, this statement of homogenization that we had for almost a, dec a decade? Yeah, so I, I think the reason we got the result we did is um, we took a data set that wasn't ever picked to look at homogenization or heterogenization, right? So any possibility of you know, unintentional bias or publication bias wasn't there. But I think, um, I didn't spend any time on it, but you notice I had this classification on the left about um, you can get homogenization, uh, sorry, um, yeah, you can get increasing beta diversity, which is increasing heterogenization just by having the regional richness go up, right? And so, I, th I think we've just thought about beta diversity through a very limit. It's always been through the generalist specialist lens. But uh, in reality, mathematically, beta diversity is the reciprocal of the average occupancy of a species. And um, so to increase beta diversity, all you have to do is decrease the average occupancy of a species. And the average is a math arithmetic average across many, many species. and so. You know, one way you can, you can homogenize by getting rid of a bunch of rare species, but you can actually homogenize by having a bunch of really, sorry, you can homogenize by having a bunch of really common species come in and rare species disappear. But there are a lot of other, a lot of other ways to move in that system that don't have to do with generalist and specialist, right? If you lift up the middle species, for example, that's actually gonna cause uh, heterogenization. Yeah, but the point is that, uh, I, as I told you today that, this, this study was for me the most surprising out of all these things because I always was used to this close to zero change of species richness and abundances and so on. But I always expected that the homogenization is the rule, exactly as Francois said. Uh, and what is really intriguing in this paper, you said that uh, uh, heterogenization can uh, be due to increasing regional richness, but it can be also due to decreasing uh, local richness. Yes. And you explore all these possibilities, yeah. and all these possibilities uh, are there, which is just incredible. Basically, everything happens in nature. What, whatever, you, <laughs> whatever you kind of have in yeah. mind, it happens, which is, for me, for me this was really the most, uh, uh, yeah, but you do, not have, you do not have these points here in these triangles, uh, but basically, the data that basically cover all, all, all this, uh, yeah. all this space, which is something really weird. Yeah, we always think about this, these two scenarios, right? Uh, homogenization is increasing the average occupancy. Yeah. 
But yeah, uh, what we found, the points are basically like a big sausage around here, and we have, we have all the different scenarios happening. And so. so for me, it is still really weird. You know? <laughs> because yes, exactly, if, if the, there was just this result that basically you are, yes, you are operating in this whatever, like increasing, increasing, uh, you know, regional diversity, and so on. that would be kind of understandable. But if anything can happen, yeah, that's <laughs> almost too much. Could it be related to the taxa? Because maybe this homogenization was really for birds, mainly, or and maybe in your study it's like other taxa than birds, or is it related to that? Yeah. The, I'm not sure I understand. If it is uh, taxon specific, but you did the analysis and it does not uh, change with the. Yeah, the, the, the answer does not, not really change with taxa, like mammals versus birds. It doesn't change with region, like tropic versus temperate. Yeah, that was really very strong. Like, this was even more surprising. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. I wanted to ask about the fish and the. Uh, the biomass, yeah, you said that the community with big fishes, big species, large species of fishes have the same biomass. So how is it possible? There should be metabolic scaling and different foraging strategies and so on. So how, how, do, how do you explain it? <laughs> yeah, um, it's not my work, but there, there's a couple of nice papers by Morgan Ernest and Ethan White where they show that uh, the most strongly regulated property of a community is the total energy flux. And the next most strongly regulated, regulated property is uh, total biomass. And the next most strongly re regulated property is species richness, right? And individual abundances of species changes all the time. So you're, you're going, so you go down that stage of abundance of species, it's changing all the time. And then you go to species richness and you get little changes and you go to uh, biomass and you get even less change and then you go to total energy flux and it's completely constant. I, and I just think that's a really cool result. So, but uh, did you explore also the, the energy flux? Like, we did not do energy yeah, flux. Because you we, can we just have, recalculate it using scaling relationships and see whether it yeah. is more or less constant than biomass. Yeah, I mean, we had trees and plankton. It would have been, would have been very hard to try and do energy fluxes, but... Um, well, but you can use the scaling. Use the scaling, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be the logical next step is yeah. to see if energy, you would predict from these other two papers that energy flux is even more constant than biomass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question about fish. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm not sure if maybe you said it, but is this, uh, can this be attributed to industrial fishing? Uh, it presumably is due to fishing, and yeah, I mean, we're basically fishing down the, the food chain, right? And, and so the top predators are getting taken out. I think the question was, there's also a lot of evidence that we shrunk fish, right? Within a species, the average size of a fish is shrunk because of fishing. Sort of the trophy hunting argument that you take the big fish out and you're causing evolutionary selection for small fish. What we found is the compositional change, which is basically fishing down the food chain. That can be also explained because the bigger fish have higher fecundity, so they uh, by removing the larger fish, they really reduce the fish diversity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't a study to do attribution, but I have to assume it was human fishing. We. The one thing we've affected more than trees is marine fish, right? We've taken 80, 90% of the large marine fish out of the ocean. We've only taken 50% only taken of the trees off the planet, so. Yeah, Hi. Uh, I'm interested in the Laplace distribution you showed for the changes in the communities. Uh, and my idea was that compared to macroevolutionary dynamics of traits, when you have the OU process on phylogeny, the rubber band dynamics, would that predict that the distribution of uh, species traits will be also Laplace distributed? Because it's commonly not. It's like Gaussian or normal distribution. I mean, if it's if it's OU, it would, like you say, it would have to give a normal distribution. But we found is well, uh, 
what I found in the literature when we were trying to explain this is a tweak of the ornstein ollenbeck right? The ornstein ollenbeck I forget, the return force is, it's proportional to the distance from the yeah. central, right? Uh, but if you uh, make it so that the return force to the center is constant, no matter how far you're away from it at any time, then you get a little applause in. So it, you it's- that the force is constant for communities? If you say that, for example, total biomass is regulated, does it mean that no matter how far it goes from some average value because time is the same strength of force thing? speed of return? Yeah, the question is about the force and the speed of return, right? They're both regulated. They both have a central tendency. And if you took this uh, augmented Dickey Foley test, they would both show that they had a central tendency. But uh, in the Ernstein Ollenbeck, you can get a little ways away and the system really doesn't care. It doesn't push you back. But if you, um, and conversely, if you get really far away, you get pushed back really hard, right? But this constant pushback it's a totally, if you get a little bit away, you're pushed back pretty hard. And if you're way out here, you're pushed back the same amount, but you're not pushed back more. And so that's how you get the Laplacian out of a constant pushback tendency. Does it make sense for community? Does it make sense? <laughs> I don't, I mean, empirically, it seems to be what's going on, but uh, yeah, I, honestly, I don't know if I have a good intuition about whether the Ornstein, I mean, the ornstein ollenbeck process was just because it was the simplest process, right? It was a linear process. So when I really started thinking empirically, which of these do I think is more realistic, I don't have a good intuition. But, yeah. Any other? Uh, I want to ask you, uh, this regulation is very strong and very robust and absolutely universal, but it's logical. Uh, but. Are there any estimates what the fraction of these feedbacks uh, or regulation is our top-down regulation and what fraction uh, bottom-up regulation and from this top-down regulation what fraction represents effects of parasites, namely viruses? Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, I, I haven't, I mean, I would love to see that kind of information. I, I, I haven't seen it, but. Um, and is it possible to, to distinguish these two kinds of, kinds of regulation from dy dy dynamics or shape of, uh, of um, return to, to the? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that would be the interesting question, right? Like I just said, energy, re energy is more strongly re regulated than biomass. You could ask, is regulation stronger? What scale is regulation strongest, right? If you had a nice data set that cross scales, you could start to ask, where is the regulation strongest? I, I've never seen anybody do that, but that would be a great thing to do. Uh, okay, any? Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a more philosophical question perhaps. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, given that you have such high turnover in the communities through space as well at this time, what exactly are you um, suggesting or is one to suggest the public to conserve or what kinds of actions are we expecting when we don't really know what we have as a baseline? How would you inform policy in such a heterogeneous system? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, that question is starting to cut in. Um, I don't know the Czech system, but in the United States, we have government land that's regulated to preserve what was there. Our national park system, their legal mandate is to preserve what was there before, and they're starting to have conversations about well, in climate change, the law tells us to preserve what was there, but can we do it? If we could do it, would we want to do it? Would that be the smart thing to do in a climate change world? And so, uh, yeah, no, you're right. That The whole notion of turnover, I think, is a real challenge to the, at least some of the paradigms in conservation ecology. Uh, as far as what we'd recommend to the public, I don't know. I, I keep coming back to, I mentioned five kinds of global change, right? Everybody's worried about climate change. I think climate change is going to be terrible for humans. I don't think climate change is going to be that bad for nature. It hasn't been historically that bad for nature. So the land use, 
and the over-harvesting that uh, still are, that's what's causing species to go extinct. And so I, I think that's the message is we have to start to connect those things in people's minds, right? And then that has all those implications. Most of the land use, some of it's cities, but actually cities are very efficient ways for people to live. It's the agriculture. People have to eat, so I'm not saying we get rid of agriculture, but we, you know, cattle take up a lot more space than a soybean, and that, that's the conversation I think we start to ha have to have. It's not, it's not plastics, it's not climate change, right? We have all these things that people are, who care about it are scared about, but it almost lets us skate over the real conversation. It's about our land use and our harvesting. It's not. Can I tell you a basic argument to have with people, and it really depends on who you are speaking to as well, how you start the process. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right. It, you can't leave values out of the conversation. So, if scientists want to move the needle on public uh, willingness to conserve biodiversity, we have to start having values based conversations. Why do you want to keep biodiversity? The reason I, as a scientist, want to keep biodiversity is probably not the reason most of the people out here or out my. It's not where they want to keep biodiversity, so we start have to start having that conversation. Uh, hello, uh, I would like to ask if there is any global spatial pattern of uh, biodiversity decrease on mainland, because we know that uh, biodiversity decreased mainly on uh, islands, but is there any pattern, is it like the biggest decrease in tropics, in uh, like temperate steeps, is there some pattern? Yeah, we've looked for patterns, you know, is it the zero line everywhere or is it um, just averaging some places of increase and decrease? Mostly it's zero everywhere. There's maybe a hint that there's a slight decrease in the tropics, and there's maybe a hint that the marine realm, uh, in particular in the marine realm, has seen faster turnover. Those are the two regions, but the hint that there's more decrease in the tropics is really weak. It's not like statistically significant. The tr faster turnover in the marine realm is statistically significant, but Looking across taxa and across realms and across biomes, those are the two places where maybe there's some slight um, breaking of the rule about zero, but it's not super common. And interestingly enough, the same applies for population changes. If you take this uh, population database, uh, actually the first thing we did was that I was thinking, okay, it's like symmetrically distributed, so it's like around zero, exactly like this, that maybe some regions are in, uh, reveal increasing population, some decreasing, and we f found nothing at all. Weird, which is weird, right? Because you would expect some differences. Yeah, I mean, this is why we started thinking about regulation. It's like yeah. zero is popping up way too often for this to yeah. just be chance or even random canceling out. It's there has to be a deep systemic reason why we see zero, slopes of zero. Yeah? Um, isn't maybe the reason why we see so many zeros that we are looking at the mean? Because the mean is just made to equal everything out. Shouldn't we start maybe looking at different statistical metrics that don't do that? Like, yeah, the median or the mean, or I don't know. There are other things. You mean like the median or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Right. Yeah, and, um, they still all come back to zero, but I, it's going back to what I said about the Laplace, I think it's important that we start to pay more attention to the extremes mm -hmm. because, I mean, honestly, we didn't find zero, we found, I think, I forget, a 0.1% increase, but to me that's zero, right? It's, you know, if we had enough data statistically, maybe it's not zero, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, it's kind of around zero, and to me that's all that matters. But, um, but the extremes are showing big changes, and I, I think that's, that's what we should be paying attention to. And you're right, if you take a geometric mean or an arithmetic mean or a median, those all those all factor in in a pretty important way to those different things. But, so I guess I'm saying the same thing, but from a different direction about pay attention to the extremes. Okay, and the other, okay, Tomasz. 
Martin, I have uh, like more f philosophical point, uh, and it's uh, like about the, your question with the four emotions that we want wants to push, and you were like asking to raise hands. I I didn't want to raise hands to either of those, and I was trying to uh, formulate what is what would be my ideal of that, and I think it's. Uh, it's hard to express, but I think it should be something, uh, for, for me, op optimal one would be something like um, admiration, you know? Like, like th this is like the divine creation. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not contrary to evolution. I, I never saw this uh, like in, in contrast with evolution, but you can see it, for example, if you look at Indian documentaries, because Indian people have like very healthy relationship with the divine elements. And if you look at their documentaries about nature, they are not afraid to express this like, wow, this is yep. so like awesome, like uh, almost like if they went to the temple. So if we hit this, I think the closest one was your slide with all those like different birds that you saw on your transect. So if you show yeah. people uh, that look this beauty and so you, you are the closest to this uh, like emotion that I would say that we need to spark in people somehow to... Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, the motion of awe or inspiration or, you know, uh, awesomeness, wonder. Yeah, um, yeah, no, you're right. That's, that's, that's what got the, the big telescopes, right? That's what got the Hubble telescope paid for yeah. was these beautiful pictures of galaxies a million, billion miles away. So, yeah, you're right. I think that's, that's another important piece. I also didn't raise a hand for these three possible reasons for protecting biodiversity because I think that there is another uh, reason, but I will not speak about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question, if there is any. No, then thank you. We can uh, all move to, to the pub and we can dis uh, continue the discussion. So thank you very much.